Hi, everybody. Welcome to our keynote speak speech today, um, where we're joined by Patrick A. Troutman, or, or Pat. Um, very, very pleased to welcome him here today. He was, I, I was reading the back bio before, and uh, it's an amazing amount of experience, and uh, very, very excited to have him here today. Uh, Patrick A. Troutman graduated in 1984 from Virginia Tech with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace and Oceanographic Engineering, along with a minor in Computer Science. In the past 35 years, he has worked for NASA designing and assessing the International Space Station, leading systems analysis related to future space scenarios, including managing the NASA Revolutionary Aerospace System Concepts Program, helping to define the vision for space exploration, leading the integration for the Constellation Program Lunar Surface Architecture, and leading human space exploration mission design for the NASA Human Spaceflight Architecture Team and the Evolvable Mars Campaign. Mr. Troutman currently serves as a lead for human exploration strategic assessments at the NASA Langley Research Center, where his current efforts include developing what the next set of activities for humans should be beyond the International Space Station, including crewed missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Wow, oh, fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to, to Pat to give a, a presentation. And then as usual, we'll open it to questions. So please fill in all your questions into the Q&A bar at the side. And after the presentation, I will, I will hopefully relay them onto Pat. So please take it away. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, I want to make sure uh, uh, I can't tell. My, oh, here comes the presentation. All right, I'll wait till it gets on the screen. So, so I'll start off by saying while it's getting up there, uh, I'm very lucky in that, uh, uh, unlike most of the people in the world now, I got to see the first moon landing. I was uh, eight years old uh, on my porch watching it on a black and white TV. Um, it, it astounded me. It astounded my family. But what was interesting, what really inspired me to work for NASA was not the moon landing, it was Star Trek. The whole thing about boldly going where no one has gone before, expanding humanity's sphere of influence. That's what I wanna talk about today. So let's go to the next slide. Very busy week that we've had uh, with respect to uh, uh, going to Mars. Uh, next slide. Um, We've already had uh, two out of three successful launches of Mars probes. Uh, every two years, there's a nice opportunity uh, for a, uh, a Mars mission. Uh, later on next week, uh, NASA's gonna launch Perseverance. And uh, Perseverance is a great name because in order to expand humanity's sphere of influence, we have to persevere. So let's go to the next slide. So what's interesting is our, our entire sphere of influence, our entire history of human space exploration has been related to low Earth orbit and a few years going back and forth to the moon. That's it. Uh, that's not quite Star Trek now, is it? Um, so I'll go to the next slide. What we're talking about doing is taking that sphere of influence, which is about, you know, we're around the Earth and on the sun, next slide, and expanding that. So our human sphere of influence goes to Mars. Because in the past, the best we've ever done is orbited Earth, whether we get the moon, or whether it be uh, in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. But what we're talking about now is orbiting the sun, breaking our bounds from Earth. And that is a huge leap. But because it's so a huge leap, there is a log logical progression of activities that we need to do in order to accomplish this noble goal. Next slide. So there's basically five hazards of human spaceflight. Um, maybe one in five are, are the same. They both have to do with environments. Um, uh, radiation, uh, the, uh, the, the two types of radiation, there's the uh, cosmic radiation, which we don't know a lot about with respect to how we uh, fight that. Uh, you can add a lot of ma mass and uh, make the problem uh, less, but mass is the enemy of all uh, space missions. Uh, the rocket equation doesn't like extra mass and causes you to use lots of propellants and lots of expensive propulsion technology. Uh, we can protect from a, a solar uh, proton event, uh, and that's basically a water shelter. So every spacecraft we're designing has some sort of shelter in case there's a solar flare or solar storm. Um, so those are big challenges, um, 
the way you address radiation is either sh shielding or speed. Uh, and so we're looking towards speed uh, as, a, as a way, at least for Mars. Eventually, you, you, there's, you're never going to be able to go fast enough you have to deal with it, but we'll get there. That's, that's the next big sphere we're going to. Uh, isolation confinement. Um, when we talk about going to Mars, uh, it's, it's a minimum two year round trip, more likely going to be three. Uh, so between those two uh, durations, it's very long. Uh, and and the, 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 the part that makes it even worse, in low Earth orbit, even if you're up there a year, at least you have internet access and instant connectivity. Once we get to Mars distance, we are isolated because we have no real time calm. Every conversation takes an hour to go back and forth. Uh, so um, uh, that, that's huge because especially the younger generations now who have instant connectivity to everything everywhere all the time, that will not be possible on a journey to Mars. Think about it, no internet. Oh my God, my kids would go nuts. Uh, distance Earth is about the same thing. Um, uh, we can, we can uh, uh, in low Earth orbit and even the moon, it's a few days away. Contingency happens, we can get back to Mother Earth and everything's well. A part goes bad, uh, we can plan a launch and get it up there you know, within a month or two. Um, going to Mars, uh-uh. There's no turning back, literally. There's no turning back uh, once you get to certain parts in the, in, in the trajectory. And those things you need in order to uh, keep the mission going, they have to be with you. You have to be able to bootstrap, you have to be able to adapt, uh, you have to be able to use what's at your destination to solve all your problems. So it's, uh, it's, it's more than camping, it's pioneering. It's living off the land. Uh, gravity, oh my goodness. Um, I have built many or designed many artificial gravity spacecraft. And uh, when you're talking about going to the Jovian system or beyond, you probably want to put that in. Mars is that tipping point. Um, yeah, three year round trip is going to be pretty rough on the crew. It'll be pretty deconditioned. Uh, we've demonstrated lots of things on the International Space Station that address those issues. Uh, but uh, in the long run, we're going to have to have some artificial gravity, I think. Uh, and so we're still trading that for Mars, but more than likely uh, due to cost and speed, uh, we'll want to go with uh, 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 zero G configuration. Um, so, so those things all come together uh, and, and to form this, this, uh, this, this uh, amalgamation of, of challenges that we have to face when we go to Mars. So how do we dress down these challenges, not only from the human perspective, but from the technology and the uh, engineering perspective? Next slide. So where we start, we start low Earth orbit. Next slide, thank you. Uh, the International Space Station. Uh, that was my, <laughs> you're, you're very fortunate these days to get one human spaceflight project in your career. I'm aiming for two. So Space Station was my first. I came on uh, very young, uh, came up with all sorts of uh, configurations of Space Station, worked with the international partners. Uh, on the US side, it came from one vote from being terminated. Uh, so politics, international, engineering, budget, all that, how does that go together to make something that's good for humanity? And this is the first good step. Yes, going to the moon in 1969 was a great activity, but we have built a foundation for exploration and enabling humans to go further by building the National Space Station, both from the experiments, uh, experiments on humans, that sounds bad, for the research on humans uh, with respect to uh, enduring the, the microgravity and the engineering of integrating such a large complex system together over multiple spacecraft and multiple years. Uh, doing that is just, just a phenomenal engineering exercise. So that's what we've got now in the International Space Station. And we've gotten to the point now where we've learned enough that we're ready to go. Next slide. Now, we're still looking at expanding what we're doing in the International Space Station to be more Mars-like. So we talked about isolation and confinement. Uh, so on Space Station, we can whittle down the available volume that crews spend, because uh, it's such a large, expansive volume, uh, over longer periods of time. So think of an analog Mars mission on the International Space Station, where the volume, the supplies uh, are similar to a Mars mission. Maybe the duration is not going to be three years, but we'll start with one and maybe expand to two. Um, and then the interesting thing is, is after taking all of them to, to consideration, and even like putting in comm delays and cutting out the internet, uh, you have a pretty good analog. Now, what you don't have uh, on the International Space Station is the galactic radiation environment. That's okay, baby steps. Maybe we won't want to do that all at once. And the other thing that's interesting, next slide, 
that we can use International Space Station for is the acclimation to gravity. Because the challenge we have in going to Mars, let's say it takes six months to a year to send a crew to Mars. When they get there, they are fairly deconditioned. Yes, we have exercise protocols uh, that we've exercised in uh, microgravity to keep them strength, but their neurological uh, uh, cardiovascular systems are compromised. And if we're talking about an initial mission on Mars where it's 30 days, uh, and it takes them seven days to acclimate and get, get around, we've just lost a quarter of our mission time. Um, so understanding how fast we can acclimate to a partial or full gravity environment is going to be very important in how we do our Mars strategy. And you'll see a little bit of that later. Next slide. So we can try that with International Space Station. Right now, the crew land, and uh, there's a whole medical team there pulling them out on stretchers and wheelchairs, getting them ready to go. The idea is that, well, we don't do that. We let them get out of the capsule, acclimate, and then they have to do several tasks simulating the Mars mission. So we've clued in the, uh, the uh, international community on, on working some of these uh, simulations with respect to on ISS and Mars. Uh, and again, it's a global effort uh, to get from this sphere to the next one. Next slide. So a great thing too that we we try to do here at NASA is that uh, what NASA does is we pioneer uh, the exploration and the technologies. Uh, once we've gotten to a point and we've developed the capabilities and, uh, and, and uh, um, systems that make that possible, it's time to hand that over uh, to uh, others so we can continue pushing the envelope and blazing the trail. So a great example of that is on the International Space Station now, we have the uh, commercial crew. And uh, next month, these two gentlemen will be coming back to Earth, uh, which is just astounding to think that uh, uh, we now have a, uh, a multiple paths to get crewed back to International Space Station, which is incredible. Uh, the folks at SpaceX, uh, uh, not only have they pushed the, the envelope of technology, but the, the, the paradigm of design uh, and uh, accommodating risk, um, and even fashion, if you look at their suits. Uh, some people really love them. Uh, I think they're cool. Uh, but uh, the, the astronauts love them, and that's what counts. Uh, they're safe. They're comfortable. Um, and uh, style is not an issue right now. All right, so commercial filling in behind NASA is an important thing you're going to see too. Next slide. So now we're going to kind of talk about the moon prepares us for Mars. So let's go look at the moon. Next slide. So we talked about those uh, five hazards of, uh, of, uh, of um, human spaceflight, uh, the environment and the distance uh, and the duration. Um, when you look at the moon, it has a lot of aspects of Mars. So if I look at the International Space Station and I look at the moon and I look at Mars, one has zero G, one has one six G, one has three H G. Well, the important thing about the moon is that it has partial gravity. So we can bend, begin that step to acclimating to gravity, even, if, even though it's not Mars matter, it's still partial gravity. Uh, with durations around the moon. So look for scenarios where we spend longer and longer time around the moon, get somewhat deconditioned, uh, get, uh, get space dizzy as we call it sometimes, um, and then go to the moon and I have a week to do a mission. Well, I have to acclimate to the partial gravity. So the, going to the moon is the only place we can test acclimation to partial gravity. We can do full gravity on earth, but maybe that's too extreme. So part of the moon is acclimation to partial gravity. Uh, of course, the moon has systems, uh, and uh, that'll be uh, exposed to the galactic cosmic radiation, just like they will be on Mars. Uh, probably a little bit more on the moon than Mars, depending on you know atmospheres and uh, you know Phobos shades the Mars occasionally and stuff like that. But it's it's a different environment than we have in low Earth orbit, where a lot of that galactic cosmic radiation is shielded by the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, dust got lots of terrible dust on the moon. In fact, the dust on the moon is worse than the dust on Mars from a, a, a engineering perspective. Now, it doesn't have any life in it that we know of, and of course, neither does Mars that we know of, but Mars could harbor it. So keeping the dust out is extremely important. And again, on ISS, we it's, it's really clean compared to these lunar and Mars systems are gonna be. So keeping the moon and Mars out and keeping the Earthlings safe and protected in their systems on the inside is very important. So the moon gives us an environment to do that before we try it out at Mars. Um, the moon is not anything like Mars with respect to delays. 
um, but we can simulate those. So we'll be looking at simulating the delays on the moon during these longer duration uh, moon missions. And uh, yeah, the cramped isolated volumes, again, it's gonna be still a little bit different. We'll be operating in similar volumes in the moon and on Mars. The deal is, is that on the moon, they'll have been very close to earth prior to doing that and going to Mars will have been totally isolated and on their own. Uh, before they do their Mars missions. But it's still a step beyond the International Space Station. So good stuff. Next slide. So this is the point out, of course, we're not starting from scratch. Um, uh, we had the, uh, the, the the space launch system, which is, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, some um, adaptation of the space shuttle technology. Uh, Orion's been in the works for a long time. It's about ready to fly. It's already it's already flown its first test mission but this next one's coming soon. Uh, we got uh, this commercial industry, uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, uh, ULA, all stepping up with new boosters uh, that uh, will make things a lot more economical for us. Um, and the more propellant and the more capabilities throw up there at the cheaper cost, the better for the crew and the better for the mission. Uh, we've been working life support on space station for 20 years. Uh, it's getting better and better. We have to make it to the point though where we just can't go in the supply closet and pull out a 10 ton unit and fix it though. We've got to make it uh, repairable in space. Uh, Spacesuits, uh, we're trying to get to the point where they're more, they're longer lived. They're, uh, uh, they have uh, replaceable units on the surface. They can be sized for any size crew member uh, and much more flexible and capable than what we had in Apollo. Uh, and of course, Given that we live in the digital age, uh, improving our space, common nav, even though there'll be delay, there's still lots of information. We want to go back and forth to the crew at Mars. Um, cool thing about uh, the, the transportation bits is they all require uh, thrust and propellant and stuff like that. So whether it be low thrust propellant to send gateway out initially or high thrust to get on and off the surface of the, the moon or Mars, uh, we're working those. And so a lot of those systems we're working for both gateway and the moon will be perfectly applicable for Mars. Next slide. So I want to talk about the major differences. A lot of questions I get is about uh, the rockets and Orion. How come we can't go back to the moon the same way we did in 1969? Um, and it's because our systems are a little bit different. Now, if you look at the capability of the rockets, uh, the biggest version of the SLS is almost as capable as the Saturn V. Um, um, awesome, awesome vehicles. Um, you know, of course, we've got uh, Blue Origin coming out with the new Glenn, uh, which is it's almost as big as these vehicles, but it doesn't have as much throw capability. You could put a, you can put an entire <laughs> space shuttle in its in its uh, uh, shroud for the most part. It's so big, um, so it's 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 quite amazing. The new rockets coming out, but we still haven't until you talk about SpaceX and the and, and the uh, Starship. There's no quantum leap in capability. Now, if Starship comes along, it might change the equation a little bit, and we're looking into that. Uh, we, we're hoping it does come along because it'll greatly uh, reduce cost and, and, and increase access and capabilities in deep space. Um, so the rock is about the same. However, what's different, go to the next slide, is the spacecraft. So just want to look at you, look at the pictures here. If you look at the Apollo spacecraft, which had a capsule that held three people, it's very small compared to the Orion capsule, which was initially sized to hold a crew of six. If you look at the service module on Apollo, it's much bigger than the service module on the Orion. And again, given that Orion and the service module were evolved from different programs with different missions, the old uh, Constellation program where we had two different rockets, they were optimized for those rocket types. Um, it doesn't lend itself to having it because the crew cabin is heavier and bigger and the service module is smaller. We actually cannot get this capsule to low lunar orbit and back. So what it has done is force us to look at a whole new set of oral mechanics using these low energy trajectories. Um, not for the crew, of course, but for the cargo that they need out there. And it turns out when you do all the math, you know, Orion is, is fairly heavy compared to the Apollo capsule. If I were to take that all the way down to low lunar orbit, I'm taking a heavier system further through the delta V curve. So it ends up costing you more propellant. Um, I would have to make the service module bigger to do that because I can get Orion to low lunar orbit, I just can't get it back. And you don't wanna have to do a rendezvous in low Earth orbit in order to get the crew back to Earth. So, we have been given these systems and 
that has forced us to look at this staging uh, capability from this near rectilinear halo orbit, NRHO. Uh, and what that does is it allows us to facilitate a reusable architecture where portions of our lunar infrastructure are there and they're used as a taxi to go up and down to the surface. But more important than what people don't realize is there's something called a ballistic lunar transfer that enables us to send cargo and pre-supplies on a lower energy trajectory where it sort of uses some gravity from the sun, steals a little momentum, and it can get to that NRHO orbit much cheaper propellant-wise than it could get to low lunar orbit. Um, and because we're borrowing some of it from the sun. So when you look at the stacked up masses going through the delta Vs and the required delta Vs when you put in logistics capabilities and resupply and propellant, it comes out a wash. So we're actually doing it fairly efficiently given the systems that we have. So hopefully that'll allay some questions we have there. Next slide. So I mentioned the gateway. Um, you have to think of gateway as, as not just a, uh, Sorry, my monitor turned black. Uh, you have to think of, uh, you can't think of the gateway as just part of the moon. The gateway is our gateway to moon and Mars. So gateways use as a staging place for the reusable lunar missions. The initial ones will not use gateway, uh, but the reusable systems as represented by the, uh, the uh, if you look at the lower right-hand corner of the stack, there's a, uh, there's, that's the lunar system down there that will come up and at least the scent element will be used each time and refueled. So we begin to be, have reusable space infrastructure, just like we have reusable airplanes or reusable cars. You know, the original settlers, when they, they came from uh, Europe to America, they took their boats and they chopped them up and they made forts out of them. Uh, they were not reusable boats back then. It was a one-way trip. Um, we need to get beyond that. We need to reuse our systems. Uh, so even though it might not be the most cost effective thing to do at this time, it, uh, it's that step of building the bridge and, and expanding humanity's sphere, making reusability part of our ideas and architecture. So that's what the gateway does. It enables reusability because when the crew is not there and the propellant's not there, something has to keep the ascent element alive. Something has to make sure it doesn't drift off into space. That's what the gateway's job on. It is a deep space port for reusable spacecraft. And we use it in the same way when we start talking about the Mars missions, because the vehicles that will go to Mars have to be provisioned. We want those vehicles to be reused, so they need to come back, they need to be re refurbished. So reusing, refurbished, resupplying propellant, the gate gateway becomes that place. Is it the most optimal thing to go from Earth to the moon or Earth to Mars from a Delta V perspective? No, it's not. Is it the long-term steady state solution to how we do things? Well, pretty much that how it ends up on Earth every time. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a trade in the architecture, but it's where we're going right now. And so think of Gateway as that, that hub. Yeah, none of us like flying through hubs and airports. It's a pain. We are all, always want to fly direct, but economically and sustainability-wise, we have hubs. Next slide. Just like with the ISS, we are now going commercial with respect to supplying that. So if you have a hub, you need a logistics system. So just as importantly, having the system there is a system that will keep it supplied. So we have a gateway logistics services contract right now. It's with SpaceX. Uh, I think there's opportunity for more um, where there are options for getting uh, uh, pressurized goods, as you see in this particular thing, uh, propellant, uh, modules you name it, deliver. We don't have to, from a NASA perspective or from an ESA perspective, deliver our own payloads. We'll have companies out there that do it for us. This is the UPS FedEx of space. This is the beginning of commerce. This is expanding humanity's sphere of influence. Next slide. So we also have commercial lunar access we're talking about. Now this is in the small scientific realm uh, where we're talking about, so we call it uh, Commercial Lunar Payload Services, CLIPS for short, but we do have a program where we're uh, contracting with industry to deliver science instruments to the surface of the moon, 10, 20, 500 kilograms, it can grow more than that. Um, and so depending on where the market goes, depending on uh, uh, the, the participation of both commercial and international industries, here's a mechanism 
that's in place where you have a payload, they have a system to get it there. It allows more access. It's increasing that humanity sphere of, of, of access to the lunar surface. Next slide. Now, you take it up a step, we've gone commercial in a big way because we're contracting out delivery of crew to the lunar surface. Uh, uh, and that's what the human landing system is. So we just had a, 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 a awarded uh, uh, three contracts on three incredibly divergent lander types. So let me introduce some of those. You've probably seen some of these already, but I'll tell you what uh, I like about them. Next slide, please. So this is uh, from the national team uh, uh, organized by Blue Origin. Uh, uh, this is a more of a traditional type approach to getting to the lunar surface. It has an ascent element, an in-space transfer element, and that's required to get it from the, the gateway orbit down to lunar orbit and a descent stage. So what you see right here are the descent stage on top and the descent stage on bottom. Um, talking about uh, cryogenic propellants in these type of things, which requires zero boil off or low duration uh, boil off in some senses. But if I take the ascent module off of it and I put cargo on the top, this is basically a, a, a stretch of uh, Blue Origin's Blue Moon concept. So not only do I get a human access system, but I get a cargo deployment system with this particular configuration. So they've got a great team of people in. This is what we'd call a more traditional approach. It looks like Apollo just stretched and expanded a little bit for four crew longer durations and a little more Delta B. Next slide. If I had to get a war to someone for thinking outside the box, I would give it to Dynetics. Um, they took reusability to heart in their configuration of this particular lander. If you notice at the bottom, there's a cluster of four engines on either side. In between it, there is a, uh, is a, uh, a, a crew module that, uh, the, and, and basically it's a, uh, it's a uh, um, uh, uh, integrated single reusable multi-stage lander. Um, if you ever, if you're a fan of an old show, maybe some of you folks haven't seen it, but look it up, Space 1999. They had a vehicle in there called the Eagle. Um, it looked very much like this. It was a truss work with engines on it that had a pod underneath it that could be changed out depending on mission. And Dynetics has taken that to heart in that that pod under there, it can be a crew module. It can be cargo like a pressurized rover. It can be a surface habitat. In order to get it through all the Delta V in the States, there are modules on the side that dock to it and transfer propellant into those tanks and through the engines. So in this particular configuration, the engines are never thrown away. We use the main spacecraft, the ascent element, and the engines. So this can evolve to a very usable system. And of course, the, the plus on this one is it's very low to the ground. The con here is that in order to launch this thing, I have to turn it sideways in my launch shroud. And so it has to handle loads in both ways, uh, but that's just a matter of engineering uh, and it may limit the size of your payloads. But really interesting concept, really different perspective. When you focus on reusability, this is one answer. Now let's go to the next slide, of course, and, and, and the ultimate in reusability uh, is uh, what SpaceX has proposed. I'm waiting for that slide to come up. So, Way back before I was born, in the really, really dark ages, every time someone drew a lunar mission, it looked like this. It maybe had some more fins on it and uh, had jaggier rocks on the surface. But uh, if you look at the scale here, you, you could see two crew members, I think maybe they're shadows, coming down on a lift uh, on the outside of that spacecraft. That thing is big. And you go, well, wait a minute, how do they land something that tall on the surface of the moon? Well, you got to remember when they're landing this, their propellant is all in the bottom. So their center of mass is very low. You also got to remember it, they've had demonstrated numerous times that they can land tall, skinny stages on rolling barges in dangerous sea states uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they've proven they can do this. Um, so, you know, coming up, uh, I think uh, Mr. Musk has said that uh, he's going to demonstrate a, a four scale version of this pretty soon. Um, we'll see. Um, this, is, this is a game changer. If uh, SpaceX succeeds on their timeline, I have no doubt that they'd succeed. If they succeed on their timeline, this changes how we do the moon and how we do Mars. Um, and we all realize that. Um, 
but uh, a, a bird in the hand's worth two in the bush. So right now we're going with the bird in the hand and that's the SLS. Uh, and uh, we'll continue with that. Uh, when Starship comes along, we'll probably reconsider things. But right now, um, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a hope uh, and uh, we hope they succeed, but uh, we're doing everything we can to help make sure that they are successful in the ventures of getting this lander down. Now, what's interesting in this particular scenario, they still have to use Orion because by the time they land on the moon and they use that propellant to get Starship back up, it's basically out of propellant when it gets to NRHO. So they still run it with Orion, they come back that way. But the Starship could be reused if you tanker it up and reuse it again. So all things looking forward to. So three incredible concepts, different perspectives, uh, but industry is leading the way here. Uh, and we're doing what we can as, 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 as NASA to make sure that they all succeed. Next slide. Now, recently, we just put out a, uh, a, a request for information, and we're beginning to uh, formulate a program for what we call the Lunar Terrain Vehicle and the Lunar Surface Science Mobility Systems, basically two classes of lunar rovers. The Lunar Terrain Vehicle, of course, sort of looks like what we had on Apollo, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe more capable. Um, and uh, the big difference between that and Apollo is it operates more than a few days. This is something that operates for years on the lunar surface. So imagine when, wow, I already hit my 30 minutes. Imagine when we, uh, we get to the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the moon, when the crew leaves, this rover is humanity's eyes and ears. They are rover, it is roving around by itself with cameras, it's helping with maintenance, it's doing science at a scale never seen before. Bigger than Perseverance is gonna be doing on Mars. This thing will be fast and capable. The smaller science rovers can go to other places other than the lunar south pole and expand the science. Next slide. So now we get to the evolution of the Moon and Mars missions. So when we're working the Moon, our strategy is first test the human systems, then do these Mars analogs on the surface of the Moon. This means that we will do mock Mars missions. We will spend a long time in orbit at the Gateway and on something called the Exploration Command Module. It's like a, it is actually the Mars transport habitat. Uh, that'll get us the, the 100, 200 day class missions on Gateway. Uh, we go down to the surface. We adapt to partial gravity. We go out into a small pressurized river, two crew, for 30 days. And they will rove the surface doing, looking for resources. Uh, they're not looking for life on the moon, but they'll simulate looking for life because that's what they'll do on Mars. So if you look at the slide on the right, the core minimalist mission we can do on Mars is send crew down for 30 days in an unpressurized rover and search for life. And of course, do other science too. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. The crew environment, the crew systems, the crew durations, it's all a dress rehearsal at the moon. And once we've done that at the moon, we're confident we can do the Mars systems. And we do all that while we're developing the Mars system technologies. Now we have blazed the trail for the moon with these foundational elements, whether it be habitats and mobility systems, just that commercial and internationals and other folks can leverage those investments, duplicate those investments, and build that lunar village. So we have an exit strategy for the moon, whereas we, our fund investment is to practice for Mars, but enable a foundational capability so humanity can spread their sphere to the moon. Next slide. And basically, I just said all that, what's on this slide right here. So if you look at the far right corner, that, uh, that uh, large uh, module on there, so this is an older, so yeah, that large module on there is the exploration command module. That would be the transport that takes the crew to the moon. So we're talking that in the 2030 timeframe of getting that up on Gateway and beginning to take Gateway from a, a multi-month capability to a six month to a multi-year capability as a dress rehearsal for going to Mars. Next slide. So, um, Hey, I just talked this slide too. What's really interesting is that is that if you look at what uh, the, the the things that we do at the moon, it it it, it involves these key tenants. Talked about the deep space aggregation. That's what we're doing on Gateway. We're aggregating our systems first for the moon, then we're going to aggregate them for Mars. Um, uh, uh, Mars transit habitat. I talked about the exploration command module. This will be the module that will take the first crew to Mars. We're talking about four crew to Mars and back. Um, but we're going to test it, outfit it, evolve it in cis lunar space first 
instead of just building one and taking it to Mars and hope everything works right. So we're going to really shake it down like sea trials, uh, but we'll use the gateway for that. Uh, the orbit, the surface operations, we're going to have something in orbit around the destination, which is the moon or Mars. That will be the local command and control center for what goes on the surface. Now on the moon, you don't really need one because we're in light time to Earth. But on Mars, that is your eyes and ears. That is your mission control. So we're practicing that at the moon. So the mode of operation is crew in orbit, crew on the surface. And what's a nice thing is on the trip to Mars, if we have issues with the two surface crew, maybe one gets sick or something, um, then we swap the crew out. So we have a spare crew actually all the way to Mars, just in case the crew gets sick. So that works out really good. So we're practicing, that's our mode for Mars, that's our mode for the moon. And we talked about commercial resupply and refueling, same deal. Now, I think we all talked about the capabilities here, and those are mostly the things having to do with the surface. We need advanced suits uh, that can uh, handle the dust, handle mobility. Uh, if you look at the Apollo guys, they came back and they had bruises on their fingertips and uh, in, their, in their legs, and, and it was really painful for them to do it, but they're heroes and, and they did that type of thing. That's expected of them. Mobile operations are key. Uh, we want to cover as much ground as possible. And so we need a mobility system that allows quick EVA. So we can't have hours from pre-breed. We want to get pre-breed down to 20 minutes or so so they can hop in their suits, go out, uh, uh, do a quick EVA. If they're driving around, you see something interesting. Discovery is not planned. Discovery is something that happens along the way. And so when you're driving around the surface of the moon and Mars, you look out the window and you say, oh, what's that? You want the capability to immediately stop, get out, and investigate. Um, so that's what the pressurized mobile operations are. And again, with the LTV, we'll practice versions of that in an unpressurized mode. Planetary protection is huge. Um, again, we get to practice it on the moon because the dust is bad for our systems and it, it doesn't smell too good, I understand. But on Mars, we could contaminate it and it could contaminate us. So we have to practice those protocols really hard and we're going to do that on the moon. And of course, the whole human robotics things, humans should be doing what humans do best, which is observe understand, provide context, and innovate. Everything else should be done by the machines. Uh, and so, so whether it's cleaning the system or uh, maintaining something, robots need to be doing that. So with respect to those on the surface and in orbit operations and practicing, here's how the moon and Mars is coupled. What we do on the moon makes Mars safer and more attainable for us. Next slide. So here's where I am. Here's a picture that was taken by uh, Curiosity. There's Earth, that little pale blue dot off in the sunset um, or sunrise or dawn. I'm not sure what sky it is, uh, but we're going from that little dot to this big planet below. Just think about that. And this is going to happen, hopefully in my lifetime, certainly in most of the folks on this, this uh, meeting here. Uh, and, and we all want to work together to address these challenges, to fill in these gaps, to innovate, so that humanity can expand its sphere to Mars. And with that, I'll take some questions. Wow, thank you so much, Pat, for that presentation. Really inspiring stuff and so, so exciting. Um, to kick things off, I, I, what I might ask a question for myself, just to, um, just because when we were back, backstage, you, I was asking you on your, on your background and Byron, how, how would you like me to describe yourself? And you said space architect. And you could see in that presentation, there were so many different systems you were introducing. Um, it, I'm sure the problem is just so complex. What do you think is the, the biggest tool to, uh, to use to, to bring together so many complex systems, in your opinion, to, to make something like this become a reality? So I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying the easiest part is the engineering. The challenging part is a consistent vision, consistent funding, a shared vision that people can agree to and work towards. Because what has happened historically is that we move forward and then the emphasis or destination switches. And then we go back and retool and reprogram, we work towards this direction. Um, what we're trying to get to with this moon to Mars strategy is that it's not about one or the other. It's about leaving Earth. And whether you're a fan of the moon or a fan of the Mars, they're both important. 
you have to use the best of both within the, the reason, the capabilities and funding and uh, political fortitude that's available. So having a consistent vision, a consistent roadmap. So you mentioned architect, okay? We're drafting a plan. But halfway through construction, if you change, you might compromise other sections of the plan and you certainly got to mess up your budget. So in order to architect something like this, you have to have people embrace, understand and support the vision. And what we're trying to do is, is, is convey that. It's about the moon, it's about Mars, but mostly it's about Earth. Yeah, wow. Uh, I guess now kicking off, since we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of questions through. Um, the first one is: Is the building of Lunar Gateway a part of the Artemis era, or was it something that came before? So certainly, Gateway, the name Gateway, the, the idea of Gateway was way before Artemis. Um, but I do want to point out the first instantiation of news of Lunar Gateway was in 1998 where we had an L1 or an L2 gateway, and we use it as a staging node for going to the moon and Mars. So the idea of a node for aggregating and working towards better things in space has been along a long time. Look at all, look at 2001 Space Odyssey and the space stations and stuff. Um, it's always been there. And it's how people move out in levels of, of, of capability and expanding that sphere. You have to build points of civilization along the way to help out something to fall back on. Um, so Gateway has always been there. Gateway was there before Artemis. Yes, when Artemis came along, did we say, yeah, we probably want to use Gateway? We did, because the plan is sustain reusable systems uh, and, and expanding our sphere out. If you just go from point to point and you stop, like we do with Apollo, you're not expanding your sphere. You're, you're looking over someone's shoulder. So Gateway has always been there one form or another, um, but yes, it's part of Artemis too. Yeah. So it's kind of like a stepping stone, I guess. It's always been that. Um... Yes, that term stepping stone was used in a lot of documents back in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. Uh, from Yuan. Um, hello from Mexico. What do you think is the long term objectives for future solar system exploration? So, even after, after Artemis program, so 50, 50 years. All right. So, uh, that goes to uh, basically why we explore. Um, and, and you'll notice a lot of people just stop when they get to Mars. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm all about Star Trek. So, Mars is just a waypoint from my perspective. So my perspective is, is that Mars is an interim uh, destination. And I worry that we optimize our investments and our strategy to end at Mars, we just may do that. So you need to look beyond Mars. You need to look to Ceres. You need to look to the Jovian system. There are moons of Jupiter that are certainly not habitable, but they're colonizable. Uh, they are big chunks of ice floating out there. Ice equals water, water equals propellant and oxygen and life. Um, same with Ceres, you know, it's a big ice blob in the middle of the asteroid belt. Um, our vision should not stop at Mars. Mars is a huge driver of capabilities and technologies, um, but it doesn't stop there because it's about expanding humanity is what it's about. Okay. Um, next questions from India. Um, amazing talk. Thank you. I'd like to know how does NASA choose astronauts, and can there be help from other other nations to apply for it? <laughs> so, astronaut has a very complex and enduring uh, uh, selection process. Thousands and thousands and thousands apply of people apply to each astronaut class, and you know there's there's online screenings and then there there's test screenings and then there's interview screenings, and uh, 
it gets down to the point where there's a very few that that make it. I mean, we're going to send four people to Mars. I don't know. Let's say by the time we go there, there's eight billion people in the world. I don't know. There might be eight billion people already. Uh, you know, you got a one out of two billion chance of going to Mars. <laughs> so it's very very select uh, when it get, comes to that. But then again, the last astronaut class, there was a, a woman there who went to my daughter's high school. It's like, you got to be kidding me. There's an astronaut that grew up three miles from me. So it's not as far away as you think, but it requires you to be that person who's willing to get dirty, who's willing to suffer, who's willing to push themselves to their limits for the good sake of humanity. Uh, and those are the qualities you need along with intelligence. And, and me as an engineer, the best astronaut is a very small person who consumes a, less food and doesn't weigh much. Uh, because I have to supply all that for them. <laughs> but, but, but it's that drive, it's that intelligence, it's that ability to bootstrap. And by bootstrap, I mean to adapt to unknown environments. Uh, exploration and, and being an astronaut is not reading a script. It's innovating on the fly and adapting to discovery uh, as you're out there. So that's the qualities you need. And uh, Again, this is a world mission. A lot of what uh, NASA does is that we work with the international community and we, we barter. Well, ESA's gonna build a service module for Orion. Well, that's a number of people who get to go to the moon or Mars or something like that. So it is an international effort and it's not just US or NASA astronauts going to the surface. It is a whole international crew. Uh, there's, another, there's another question on here as well that is, connected with a, a, another question. There's quite a few questions about this topic. It's about, it's about the gravity problem. How, how, how do you solve gravity? And is it, specifically, is there any other ways to achieve that without using um, um, centrifugal forces or, or, other, or other techniques? Is, how would you go well, about that? So on, on, eh, again, on Star Trek, they turn on the, the gravity field. I don't know how they do that, but we don't know how to do that. Um, we have to use centrifugal force in order to generate gravity. Now, it doesn't work to have a center view on the spacecraft and spin them around really fast. Uh, that might help with some aspects of it. Um, but if we're talking about years and years and years, uh, the spaceships generally have to be very large anyway. And if my spaceship gets very large anyway, all I have to do is rotate it very slowly and align it correctly. So some of the concepts we looked at in the past for a nuclear thermal propulsion, for example, work out great for artificial gravity because they're impulsive. They fire at the beginning of the mission and they fire at the end of the mission. In between, you spin the jets up and it's just turning end over end very slowly because it's so long, because there's a reactor at one end and a habitat at the other end. Artificial gravity is not that much of a challenge. Now, if we talk about a low thrust vehicle that has to have constant thrust, and has to be pointing a certain way and while pointing at the sun while the vehicle's rotating, it gets very complex when you do that. We have configurations that, that can do that, but they're not small, they're not cheap. Uh, so that's why I say Mars is an inflection point. Uh, if we wanna get to Mars sooner, we probably won't build an artificial gravity vehicle. Once we've gotten to Mars and we've proved it's viable, the next set of vehicles, I can see those being artificial gravity. Uh, another question is, I guess, I guess in a way touching on what I, the question I originally asked you and you were talking about the one vision um, aspect to it. It's about how to, how to communicate that vision forward and especially to encourage people to, to spend money on space exploration. I'm sure a question often asked is, well, why shouldn't we be spending money on Earth um, and not going to the moon or Mars? How do, you, how do you convince these people? Well, okay, so there's, there's, you have, a, have to have a good why. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, uh, NASA has a whole series of good reasons why. The thing is, is that why is a personal thing. Why has to resonate with the individual? Uh, so we all have our different perspectives on why. Uh, so I'll give you my perspective because I can't impose it upon you guys. But the reason why I think it's important to explore is because if you look at nature, I got two eyes, I got two noses, no, two nostrils, two ears, two hands there's redundancy in nature. We have one biosphere. So whether it's a pandemic, imagine a worldwide pandemic happening, whether it's a war, 
whether it's an economic collapse. When civilization is at its peak, like it should be now, um, we have the resources, the will, and the capability to make this happen um, because it is an investment in our future. It is an insurance policy for Earth. Now, I'm not going to say Earth's going to wipe itself out or come back and repopulate it, but having knowledge, civilization, some other place to help with problems on Earth when it gets bad and an isolated biosphere could be a good thing. And eventually it will be. If you look at the vision of some of the industrialists that are putting a lot of their own money into the system, it's all about the second biosphere. Uh, it, it's all about doing that. Now, science all by itself, it's a good reason to go do. Why send humans for science? Because anytime you put a human there, they get that unique human attribute of understanding context and discovery immediately. But that's not why I support sending humans. I support sending humans because it's the right thing to do for the future of our children and our grandchildren. Yeah. And selling, uh, so, so how do I get the vision out is what we're doing right now. We're talking about it, we're discussing it. I have student design competitions. I think they're presenting at an associated conference here uh, where we look at these future problems. And not only do I grasp their innovations, but I plant the seeds of the big overall strategy and what we want to go do. So it's, it's about discussion, education, and getting on the same page, which is what we're trying to do today. Right, sure. Uh, and there's a number of questions regarding um, the, the challenges for living on Mars. And that, I think we'll, we might be up at till time at that point after this. But one of, one of them reads, what measures and training are taking place to be socially and mentally capable of adapting to long distance travel and attempting to settle on the on the Martian surface. So I'll go back to the, the two things we talked about, the astronaut training, that's a criteria. They have a lot there. They look and screen and test for things like that. The second aspect is what we talked about doing on space station, actually having long duration Mars mission analogs on space station. Now they, they've done it on earth. They've locked people in rooms for months and years and stuff like that, uh, but you're on earth you can push a button and get right out. Space station, at least, you have to wait a few days or a few months before you can get down there. It's more realistic and it's in space and you're in zero G and you're in this claustrophobic closed environment and you can't get out. Uh, so the combination of training, screening and simulation is how we're gonna address that issue. And it might be the biggest challenge we have. I think we're we're near very nearly out of time. So I think kind of a last a last question to ask you because you are, I guess, just talking to a room full of uh, young young people passionate about space. What 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 do you think got you got you there in the future? What advice can you give um, to us? Um, so I started off as an I wanted to be an architect for buildings, and uh, but then I thought back to what was important. And yeah, buildings are important, but uh, if you're architecting the future for humanity, uh, that's even more important. And again, I told you I was very inspired by SpaceX and stuff. Um, so uh, I switched my major over to aerospace engineering. Uh, my father was in the communication satellite industry. So he was, he was a big international traveler and dealt with all this type of stuff. And I thought, well, that's my dad's job is pretty cool. So a uh, little about inspiration from Star Trek, a little inspiration from, inspiration from my father. Uh, but you have to be comfortable with what you're doing. Um, I had a student, uh, he was one of the best uh, innovative systems guys I'd seen coming out of school. And he spent six months with us and he said, you know what, I'm changing my degree to forest management. I go, why? He goes, well, I wanna make a difference right here. And, I, and, and he thought I'd be mad at him. And I know, I said, no, follow your bliss. If you're not happy with what you're doing, you're not gonna be happy. So. It's not about money, it's not about prestige, it's about your passion and being able to use that passion for the better good. And that'll make you happy. Yeah. Very true, so very, very true. No, well, thank you, Pat, again, right. for, the, for your presentation, for the answering all these questions and your time. Uh, very, very inspiring stuff, so thank you. All right, you're welcome. Have a great day. Bye-bye.